<gasps> Ooh. I had an insight this morning down at the barn shoveling poop. So if you think of culture as a grouping, you know, um, let's say Christian culture, Catholic Catholicism as a culture, or uh, being an American as a culture, or a certain language, you know, uh, I primarily define culture as language norms and taboo. And you think of it as a grouping, then the peop there's then that's what I w you know think of as culture, and when I think of a collective, I think of like if you had all these little dots inside of the culture. And then in this grouping, you had all these little dots. The collective was not something that was defined by this context, but was enacted in a participatory manner. So if this person in this cultural grouping was talking to this person, was talking to this person, was talking to this person, then in that, that <clears throat> time, that duration du during which they were participating, they were actually something that wasn't bounded but that was a morphic resonance and so so it was it was inherently cross boundary right so if you and I were in a participatory discussion like we are now and we were in from profoundly different cultures then I would say that this is a participatory field and not a cultural field mm. so I started to think of the collective as um, and and I started to see some of the confusion in some of the spiritual traditions because the spiritual traditions have always rejected culture as an intermediary so mm -hmm. most of the spiritual traditions you do individual practice and then that brings you to that's the microcosmic level and that gives you insight into the macrocosmic cosmological and they've always rejected the culture as being i mean the 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 secular culture as being a mediate mediary the mistake that they make though is then they made their religious traditions or their lineages bounded entities mm -hmm. and so what my insight was the possibility that this new emergent field a participatory collective that is being enacted in real time was like the mesocosmic order. So you have the microcosmic, then the macrocosmic, and what was emerging was this mesocosmic order. Mm. And that solved another problem, another new conceptual nuisance that I've had, and that was um, <clears throat> this concept that um, that when you move from the microcosmic story of the individual enlightenment to the macrocosmic story of cosmological, let's say, evolutionary spirituality, then you can't derive a planetary ethos, right? There's no, there's, there's no meso structure in between. Mm -hmm. And so with this collective, participatory mm -hmm. collective, you could actually participate on a planetary scale and so the story the cosmological story story has to go through like the geo history of the planet the the planet and the earth story with the is the story that we share with the cosmology so it kind of fit nicely into this planetary ethos i had so just just kind of making this distinction between the collective as a participatory thing and culture as it arises in our evolutionary history as an exclusionary principle um, was a, a little insight that I had that I think I'm going to um, use at least for a little while until it becomes its own conceptual nuisance. <laughs> um, I, my, I really, um, that felt good. That felt good and true. Um, yeah it feels good okay. it's got some radical implications it means like you know it says don't look for the 
answers in statism or nation, nationalism or in the United Nations or in interfaith dialogue, right? Because all those bounded cultures are, there's some confusion in what we've been waiting for. You know, what we've been waiting for is this other sense. And this kind of fits into your thing about theater people because it's, it, if you think of identity of the collective as something that's constantly enacted, it's it's not, it's a fluid, I forgot how you started off, but you said fluid something, fluid personalities or fluid roles or yeah, flexibility you know, in flexible, how they in consciousness, consciousness. Yeah. So it's cool because you'll see that the morphic fields then at the human level are constantly being enacted and arising and emerging and um, having a vibrant kind of network yeah. that isn't, that's, that's fluid and isn't just, just niches and boxes that people fit in and then there has to be some kind of dialogue between belief systems that for the most part, are incommensurable. So, so it was an interesting way of, of looking at things. And the other thing I like about it is that the collective enactment doesn't can be between human and human, or human and animal, or human and plant, or human and um, works of art. You know, you could have a participatory experience with a work of art, and so it becomes very a myriad display of something. Culture, true or false, culture arises out of participatory experience. Well, <clears throat> we have to know what we mean by culture. And mm. so in my, in my current understanding as it composes itself, um, I've been doing a lot of studying on animism, you know, and wondering, you know, where are we from? What, what, are, what were humans born out of? And one of the things that I discovered was because early animist mystic societies, no, there weren't even societies, they were tri little, you know, tribes, totemic, totemic people, okay? Because the anthropologists went and studied them and they found that totemic people thought the buffalo were persons and certain plants were persons and certain rocks were persons they 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 misunderstood totemic people they thought animism meant everything was everything was imbued with intersubjective qualities right well it turns out this is a grave mistake that that the early totemic cultures were actually more exclusionary than us because only some plants were persons, only some animals were persons, and only some humans were person. Oh. And it gets really, really interesting. So I guess, is this okay if this is one of the times where I talk a lot? Sure. Well, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So, and this will give you some insight into my insight. So this is what I've been learning. I've on my third or fourth book in cultural anthropology and animism and so what it, what's very interesting so if you imagine early man coming out of his animal nature right in his animal nature um, we have what I call incompatible goods you know it's it's good that the fox eats the rabbit so she can go home and feed her bunnies but it's good that the bunny goes home escapes and goes home to feed her babies right. so so early man is just part of this this natural state of incompatible goods and then the self-consciousness in him is coming and he understands that he can either take the role of predator or prey and what you see in these animistic society society is not a good word the, these animistic clans these totemic clans is that they talk a lot about shape shifting. So to be, you're not always a predator and you're not always prey. It depends upon the enactment. Mm -hmm. And so when the hunters go out to hunt, they get into this liminal space because they don't know if they're humans. Because if they get eaten, they're not humans. They're dead already, right? And so you get this, this, 
this sense that only some people are humans and it's your clan and your totems only some animals are sacred because they're persons too so you would never eat them and it's a constantly a revolving door so if you're really really sick you're on you're in the liminal stage you're you may be dead already and everything else is either a monster or dead or not human including other people and it's so exclusionary that if you don't enact the the rules and rights of the tribe you are then considered not a person either right so you can be cast out and mm. You can't take care of yourself, so you would die. So we start from actually animism, which is an exclusionary, um, more, m much more an exclusionary principle. As early man is trying to understand, it, there, you know, starting to understand that there's this role in between um, beings. Out of this, and 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 a lot of that, what is established here are rules of etiquette they're not etiquette like we have them but they're around eating so who gets to eat who who gets to be eaten and we see this of course in sophisticated uh, rituals like ca Catholic communion you know who gets to eat and who gets to be eaten and and taboos of, of all sorts and so the religious impulse and then then uh, young late in his life talked about the religious impulse being this uh, categorization of exclusions. So what is good versus what is bad? What is, no, you know, all these normative rules, these negative dialectics. And out of all of that becomes culture, right? So it gets more and more sophisticated. The categories get more sophisticated. And so the fundamental confusion about that being a morphic field is that it has that, that that it's basically an exclusionary principle over time it's been expanded and this is where we can be proud of our modern society we actually include more now you know so we're talking about dolphins and we're talking about um, pets as having rights so so this is this is kind of interesting because the trajectory is toward um, more inclusion of personhood mm -hmm. and to me that's that's the collective that is emergent and it's not coming through the culture that 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 culture the the the, the great waves of cultural arisings or emergence or codifications have actually been obstructions or obscurations or something and and this is resonates with what uh, spiritual traditions have often said you know and Aurobindo really st struggled with it and it it um, yeah I mean it's a radical critique for example of of uh, someone like Teilhard de Chardin who who saw that culture and cultural learning was the blossom on evolution and 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 so I would just switch the nuance between culture as we know it and collective as actually emerging a question here to sort mm -hmm. of open things up maybe is so we have a cultural value now of inclusion of including persons more and more um, is that is a cultural principle of inclusion the same as um, you said? Um, what was the word you said? You said a community collective. Uh, collective. Collect yeah. Yeah. Participatory, participatory collective. collective. PC. Right. Not political. Right. Collective. Um, well, I have uh, an, I've, an intuition on that, but I want to see where you go. With that. Yeah. So. So we're kind of making distinctions that haven't been made before and agreeing to say culture is something and that is the exclusionary impulse mm -hmm. and of course all these these systems self-maintain and self-liberate right and so as the process becomes more toward participatory collective they become transcultural movements and they self-liberate so then I would say at a certain point yeah so so in the transitional phase is it 
is it the language of culture or the language not of culture? And and I'm just trying to make a dis distinct. I don't want it to be a false distinction. I want it to be a new distinction. You know, I don't I don't want it to be imposed on what's real, but it it perhaps can be a, a perspective that um, creates you know solves well, so a little bit of my nuisance. Here's my here's my sort of hit and understanding yeah. of your words so far is that participatory collective and part and participation which is naturally inclusive naturally inclusive happens in any culture between cultures and in all and has happened and can happen in all times because it's just about what happens between us no matter who the us is or how many of us there are when we get together and interact and participate. So it's not so much about the the principles or taboos or rules or understandings or beliefs with which we operate amongst ourselves or behave or exclude one another. So I was thinking even if the even if a cultural value becomes one of inclusion, a principle of inclusion, it's still operating a bit on a principle of exclusion, which is that our value is to include as much as possible rather than to exclude, which either other people are doing or we did in the past. Yeah. And, the oper and operating on a principle in that way is still not the same as what happens when you simply, when you just when you engage with people and you part and you participate with them everybody can participate well, you, well yeah yeah okay, let, let's slow down so i would say and uh, so for the purposes of discussion i'm going to be an advocate for my new idea okay great so we can suss out whether it's robust or something and, and, and instead of me trying to beat up on myself with all my own distinctions. So I would say that not every, I think I would say from this new position that um, it was inconceivable for early man to participate. Mm. You just couldn't. I mean, you couldn't go out and when they, you know, especially if you read these books, it's, it's kind of like the river people ate pineapples. They smelled the pineapples. They were monsters. So, so in this clan, it, you just wouldn't, you, you couldn't get post formal as an early man and go out and hang out with a river dweller. The, 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 it turn it, it seems to me that the, in, exclusionary even the mind was excluded from those kinds of ideas right so we're talking about a radical shift here okay great so and they so objects. they were just objects and they couldn't be anything else yeah and this one guy is trying to write about it so he calls them sometimes monsters that or sometimes they're just dead or they're objects or they're monsters like transitional forms but they're like scary things you know they're not they're not yeah you wouldn't participate they have to be exercised, exorcised or something. So the fact that you can make a statement like you just did to me shows that there's something really novel has happened, right? Mm -hmm. So and we know that there's ranges of that, like um, the status of personhood that slaves had in different cultures. Sometimes they were almost like people and they happened to be caught up in a slave economy. Sometimes they weren't really they weren't people you know and <clears throat> so and then we can think of the future where there's true participation with with what we think as objects it's kind of interesting you know um, and at scales that are both what we consider sub subhuman like like a donkey or superhuman like the planet or Gaia or something we we don't know this is that part of, is just truly imaginary um, but then I think your your statement about principles a principle based inclusion is still exclusionary so this is not principle based because every time you make a principle there's got to be what's not what doesn't fit this is participatory based and what's really interesting is that it 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 
captures something of the flavor of animism because in animism, even though it was exclusionary, to be a person, you had to enact personhood. You couldn't go and hang out at the river and eat pineapples. So it takes that part, it makes it less principle and conceptual based, mm. and it moves it into an mm. inclusionary mm. framework without the meaning inclusion as being principle based. So that I think is a, is a good point that serves my argument well. Right. So thank you for making it. Yeah. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I am here for the serve. Um, I was I was thinking that when you were talking about the future of of um, a, a future where we can participate with objects, you know, uh, things that we consider objects. Now, I was thinking, oh yeah, that's that's um, I mean that's obvious. Like anything, if I want to, I can engage with it as a thing over there that I. Is basically a subtle dismissal or disregard. It's like a firm wall or something. But even even like the wall, I can turn to it and I can open in an intersubjective way. I can actually open to it and see what it will teach me. I did this with um, like I was doing some elemental meditations one day and I just sat by the water and I opened to it and in, you know dialogue, you know, but like subtle to see what it what was for me and taught me. Yeah. And um yeah, it seems like there's actually no limit to that. But it is a practice, like you're saying. It's not it's an it's something that is a potential. <clears throat> it's an enactment. That's awesome because because I I do this generative self course, right? And then you go through levels of shadow and shadow is always that part that excludes, right? And beneath the cultural level, there's the archetype, and then the animal level, and then there's the elemental level. And so I actually never heard, heard anyone say that they did an elemental uh, contemplation or elemental meditation. But I, but I know that the, the Zen Buddhists do this. You know, they, I mean, the traditional, very archaic, old tradition of um, they meditate in front of rot rotting corpses so they can be equanimous between form and form, life and death, form and formlessness, elementals, all the way down. And, and these are very, very profound, what I call, you know, deep phenomenology, shadow practice. Um, so that's really cool because that, and, and of course, opening up to something that's an object is got that feeling of being participating somehow, you know. Um, and one of the one of the things that I find helpful, but it's it's certainly not necessary, is um, instead of calling it intersubjectivity, instead of using what's the subject and what's the object, mm -hmm. we work with this notion of agency. Okay, so if I look at the wall, it has a lot of agency. I mean, mm -hmm. I know it has a lot of agency because if I run into it, it's not going to move. You know, I mean, we, agency is is that kind of Solidity is an, is an agency, you know, and the other thing I like to t say, way I like to talk about agency is like the great migrations in the Seren when the Serengeti Plains flood, you know, the great wildebeest and elephant and hippopotamus migrations, right? So we see the animals have a, having agency, but you can... You, you can actually see that the water has so much agency that, he, that it draws enormous numbers of animals. So once you start playing with, and, and, and so for me, this is neo-animism, and that is not that things, you, you know, not only this concept of making persons, but to see that everything has agency. And, and sometimes the things that we think has the least agency, like, you know, physical objects in the universe like weather actually have the most agency, mm -hmm. and 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 that discussion is is really fascinating. And then it becomes truly participatory. Hmm. Well, you know, I it's still confusing to me whether the the wall the wall is a good example because it feels dead. <laughs> it's not like the water, like elements actually feel alive in some way, but the wall feels dead, <laughs> and um, or never alive, something like that. And 
it's not clear to me that it has its own subjectivity or something. Yeah. I don't know where the communication or the relationship or the teaching comes from, and I don't know if it's receiving anything from me, but I can still I can still participate in the same way I participate with you. I can still do the same energetic, I like the word, enactment. The yeah. same, I can take I can enter the same energetic stance temporarily that I would with anyone if I want to be more present with them and open to them more fully. I can do that with anything. I don't know what it does to that thing. Yeah. I know what it does to me. Well, you know, I think the wall, uh, Wilbur would say it's a, it's a heap. It's not a whole on. So, you know, we can, um, um, uh, and these are just techniques to describe our relationship. Um, so you could say, you know, I, I don't have a relationship with the wall, but, but, I know that my cells are exchanging electrons and photons with the atoms in the wall. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that the wall has it has agency in the sense that um, it's in relation to, it's in structural relationship to gravity, for example, which is why it stands as a wall. And so actually gravity has agency. So, you know, these are just, these are just, they're not important um, distinctions they're just different ways of of how you can describe the experience of participation with something like a wall or um, if it if it was a wall like you know the Vietnam Memorial it would have a different sort of participation and and how you talk about that is yeah it feels like there's a lot of potential there. It feels like there's a lot of potential there. It feels exciting in the same way that um, a lot of the intersubjective practice groups feel exciting. Like, like pointing out that we can consciously participate together and, and see what happens. Like a new like a new tool, a new organ to develop much more fully than we have as yet. So let's come back to what you were talking about with um, participatory um, collective. collective. Yeah. Is there more, is there a direction that we were going? Because I have another question, but I'm No, I, sure. I'm pretty much wrapped up with that, so let's All right, go. So, so let's, let's, let's keep going there, because I like participatory collective it feels more exciting to me than cult than c culture feels beautiful enjoyable full of value as we were talking about it like to exclude things is to create oneself so there's lots of beauty that gets created and lots of insight that one has by excluding other things um, but participatory collectives as we're talking about them, feel like they have more potential to um, sort of uh, meet us in our personhood and also um, treat, to treat ourselves as persons even more fully and also to help us go where we all want to go as, as people on the planet. Um, so I'm wondering now, and I think the distinction between principles of inclusion still being culture and participatory collective still being something else in that. I think that's worthwhile for now. So now I'm wondering what happens if we keep engaging in participatory collectives? Does culture come out of that? Does it never come out of that? Or, you know, I have lots of friends who are into different things, different, you know, kind of like leading edge things and it feels like lots of people are trying to create a new culture trying to create a like a western or american culture or something that has some depth <laughs> some depth to it and uh so you know what so there's just the question of what the relationship is between these two things i mean in a way especially in when in the collective participation 
uh, groups that you know I'm thinking of, spiritual groups, for example, there's a lot of emphasis on what's new and what's unknown, what's coming next. And when I engage in that sort of relationship to the present moment and to my interactions with people, it actually doesn't feel like like there's much that gets deeply established or rooted in the way that like culture or history feels like it's deeply established and rooted because it feels more like like Terry Patton was, would say it's like a praxis and so what gets established is a praxis but what's happening between us is novel and uh, I don't know if that what that leads to in term if you do it long term with a group of people you know re- repeatedly whether that creates culture <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I'm arguing that culture originally comes out of this exclusionary, has this exclusionary aspect to it and is maintained by ritualized participation, right? Mm-hmm. That, that, that there's, I don't really want to use participatory collective because it's such a modern way to think of First, you have to be an individual to think of participatory collective, and the early man was less individuated at all. That ev- that's even mo- you know another modern uh, phase. Um, but I think part of this is um, um, kind of like what we we're talking about personality. I mean, your uniqueness is going to come up, and you're going to have a default pattern. Um, especially if you're not experimental about yourself or not a theater person. Um, And that's okay as long as we don't reify it, you know, so you take a snapshot of it. I mean, this is, of course, one of one of the things we do all the time. You know, you have a nice Thanksgiving and then you want to do it the same way next year and you do it the same way next year and it was nice, but then at a certain point, the fact that it's always the same actually becomes a burden and, and, and so there's there's that mixture of when is something kind of falsely reified and when is something just kind of um, in, reenacted in a participatory way. Mm. Um, and I think that's true for the ego and the personality, you, you, you know, um, to have a stable way of sh- that you show up in the world is not a bad thing, but if it's falsely reified, so so you're actually putting an effort to show up that way when it's a disconnect with what you actually feel or something, then then there, then there's a problem. So I would say in many aspects today, a lot of what is culture is falsely reified, and and of course it's all you know we see that that's where people are actually working on their cultures, right? So um, uh, fundamentalism is the opposite move. Fundamentalism Mm -hmm. is the move to go back and more strongly Mm -hmm. reify um, the symbols and systems that are not actually um, enacted in a participatory way. Um, A young child, you know, a young child in the modern world on the internet who is, you know, being forced to marry <laughs> an 80-year-old cousin is probably not enacting the culture in a participatory way. Um, so it leads can lead to false false consciousness. Mm-hmm. Even though there could be a lot of group cohesion, but it's 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 not, you know, things a lot of the individual and the um, a lot of things have changed, so now it's a false consciousness. Mm. <clears throat> okay, here's another distinction to make. Um, culture as um, As as behavior and rules that come from exclusionary, uh, yeah, exclusions of a different kind. Principles, yeah. Exclusionary principles. Um, the praxis of opening 
in participation with someone or something. And then that gets mixed of what a thing or a person is. And then, but what about just what happens between two energy fields? Like, whether I open to you or not, we're interacting. I don't have to do a practice for us to be participating together. I don't have to do a practice to be affected by the walls and the floor. And that seems like even more inclusive because it's just it's just innate. It's just the fact of being affected by one another. Yeah, so now we have to, you know, at a certain level, everything is always participating with everything else. There's no, there's no exclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and that realization makes participatory, collective participation easy because everything's just always so so you know i could play the devil's advocate i don't really believe this but you know since we're playing around with these definitions i could play the devil's advocate and say that's precisely why all cultures are merely exclusionary efforts because you take away the exclusionary effort and all you have is participation so i could say that what we're always doing is culling from the sum total of participation um, um, transformational identities, which is cool as long as you don't reify them. So from that perspective, we could actually make a stronger argument against these subnets of identity. Mm -hmm. I like it because I actually like adding that that third tier because <laughs> it it instead of making it polar what we're talking about it makes it more of a spectrum yeah because even the even in that middle way of the praxis of of being participatory with someone else like you're talking about thanksgiving dinner or something like that we have to pick up we have to use every behavior is inclusionary it's this behavior not that behavior mm -hmm. when you invite people you don't invite other people mm -hmm. right so like we have to use culture while we're being open to one another. So it's not, yeah. they can't be separated, you know, they can't be totally separated. Yeah, and the key is, the way we see it today, is to have that be a, a viable, fluid, um, semi-permeable membrane, not a bounded uh, prison. You know, mm -hmm. not not like if you go down the river and eat pineapples, you're not a human, you know. So that's a little, for, and for all times, you know, uh. except it doesn't last for all times because th these, these structures self-liberate. And that's not because it seems to be a universal law or something. But, um, yeah, so in that sense, it's, it's a both and um I don't want to make a, a universal principle out of my insight. I just, it's to me an insight. The purpose of an insight is nothing to clutch onto it as universal, waiting for another insight. Is to, <laughs> is to make what was either a nuisance or some kind of solid thing more alive, has more life in it. You know. Ooh, I like it. The purpose of an insight is to make something that was solid have more aliveness in it. Yeah. <laughs> I like it too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think what happens is this is why some of these spiritual technologies are both fantastic and problematic because they do that. They make something that was solid have more life, and then people make that into a solid thing <laughs> you know and this is this is the move that is that is counter punctual to actual insight you know <laughs> what <laughs> it's <laughs> <laughs> We've said so 
some important things today already. <laughs> so I think we've said important things, and let me, let me. <laughs> we could forget them by the uh, time we this is over. Them. We'll forget them. The only thing that's going to remember everything is the Akashic record. You know, <laughs> that's the only thing that's going to remember everything. We're always forgetting. Well, everything. the organism somehow always remembers the fun. Ah, uh, interesting. I think. Um. Okay. Let's see. Do I... Quiet. <laughs> see? Everything wants to participate all <laughs> the time. We'll have to make exclusions. Okay. I want to go further. Okay, good. Because this leads in important directions that I often go. Okay. Two things. One. <laughs> there's a bullet head. There's like a bullet list. I don't think it's really bulleted. That's too dry. No, that's but. okay. You just that's fine. Continue. Yeah. We're like a it's a landscape we're exploring here. Um, okay, here's the one thing. When everything becomes, um, we've talked about this before, but the movement we just made and the pointing out of what insight is for is something that I end up coming back to a lot I think and it has to do with the the when everything everything from to the deepest um, you know fundamental insights to the most concrete personal requirements becomes relationalized and so everything is relationalized there seems to with the next step always seems to me is deep pragmatism like what is anything for in relationship to everything else and is that where I want to go I, and I, I see that deep pragmatism opening up in spirituality more and more I see it opening up in relationship to culture more and more in relationship to um, disciplines in relationship to education and health there's like this deep question we have access to lots of stuff what are they for where do we want to go and a, and a refocusing on value values so that's one one direction another direction is that um, somehow the um, somehow saying Somehow that pragmatism often comes to me with a feeling of tragedy. Like everything gets relationalized and then so it loses its own, it loses its independent, it loses its independent meaning and even purpose like where we want to go together is relationalized in this, in this space. So it too is only it's like I'm, I'm shading towards nihilism. I can feel it, but I don't quite know how to get out of it. But just like today and yesterday, that tragedy is sort of like switched into humor. Why I started laughing, because everything is, it's just, it's just funny. <laughs> it's just like there's no, you can't, you can't land anywhere, and it's just funny. It's, I still feel regret it. I still feel like it's regrettable. That everything mm -hmm. becomes utilitarianized and, and becomes pragmatic in this way. It, it there, again, there's still the, there's these shades of nihilism in there. Um, but I recycle through this. What we've just done here, I recycle through this a lot, and I'm wondering what comes next and where we. Yeah, what comes next, basically. Um. Yeah, so, so, I think that the situation obviously becomes more exasperated the more significant the insight, right? So, if you have a significant insight into the nature of reality or the emptiness of self, something like that. <clears throat> And it overwhelms, right? It overwhelms. And then there can be 
um, what I would call, and I'm not saying this is what you said because I'll just start talking and then maybe in somewhere here is what you said or, or more more idea of what we're saying, okay? I'm not saying this is what you said, but so you have these significant insights and then um, there can be this experience of frame shift. So either I'm in this significant insight frame or I'm in this ordinary frame mm -hmm. and they don't seem to really have that much. It's not necessarily their intention. They're just in this too much of an either or kind of situation that feels comfortable. So I either relativize the significant in, insight as something practical or I'm in a state of nihilism and say everything that's practical is so relativized by the significant insight it doesn't may have any meaning anymore. So that's something that, you know, I've experienced is the sense that there's just frame shifting rather than it's like you need an insight on these these two things now, you know, and then that of course can come with the same problem. So that that I can see would tend to and then it could be funny because what's funny is that that they're like jokes of each other. It's like it's like that thing I always say. How much does the scale weigh? You know, the question is is a relational joke. So so um, I don't know how to answer that question, but what came up for me was this concept of this notion of effort. You know, this is a very richly nuanced word in Taoism, effortless effort. And I think that that the nihilism comes into play when you think you have to add effort to make the insight practical. Mm. And and I don't even know how to explain that. I don't know why that came up in me, but that's the that it's like It changes your world, it changes your behavior, and that alone is somehow pragmatic, even though we wouldn't necessarily know. So it's not instrumentalized, we didn't put it in an instrumental package, but it's it's shaped something. And that so to me that that's a pragmatic thing, even though we don't necessarily know how to name it or create meaning from it. Um, um, so the ordinary, it's not like the ordinary shifts, but the, the ordinary is now headed in a different direction than it would have otherwise been, even though it just feels just as ordinary and relative as it did before. Um, so that would be a little story that I would tell. Um, it's not really an explanation because it doesn't really fit, but um, yeah, but I, but my sense of that, that, that place is this concept of frames that switch without really, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, there's a parallel. I have to say, I don't have the problem anymore. So at some point, well, that's great. Yeah, my yeah. intuition is that it's non it's a non necessary problem, but I can't. I I'm, I haven't moved through it yet. You know, I have not moved through it yet. Um. But it feels like there's a parallel. To, I need to do a caveat here because my understanding of spiral dynamics is actually not that deep. But it feels like there's a parallel to the shift from like green to yellow. Where if green is like things are relativized, yellow is like okay, but what do you care about? Like what's most yeah. important? <laughs> like there's still better <laughs> things than other things, you know. Yeah. So there's this pragmatism. But, yeah, uh, I think that that that's. 
that's a good description of the cognitive tension between th those two operational levels. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is, and the reason why it's good that you're in, is too many people, because green and relativism is so hard, too many people re um, kind of discard it to get to this faux yellow. Right, if we're going to talk in these terms, so that so that things become simpler, but because but they become simpler in a reduced way. If you truly commit to the skill sets and capacities at the pluralistic stage, that shift is much harder because it's not that the relativistic view goes away; it's that and something else. You know, this is why the term transcend and include is difficult because when people think of transcending pluralistic, there's a sense that, oh, I'm done with all that difficulty now. <laughs> <laughs> Pluralism is always difficult, right? It's always difficult. Um, so, so that, so the fact that you're still there and it's more complex it is to me, a sign that it's healthier, and 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 I think that you have intuitively identified people that have made the move in this false way. I mean, y you can just tell. I mean, they've got something of the integrative aspect, but they no longer include the pluralistic, the, the immensely complex situation of the pluralistic viewpoint is too easy to skip through. It's very, very, um, yeah, I think it's a very, it's a very big skill set challenge. And to say that this isn't, that the way I'm describing it isn't, isn't only and not even primarily cognitive. The way I experience mm. it is like very much suffusing everything. Could say it's visceral, but it's not only visceral either. It's like everything, all everything, and um, so it goes really deep. <laughs> it goes yeah, really deep. yeah, it's a whole paradigm. You know, it's 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 the way values come up. It's the way you just describe spiritual insight gets relativized everything is always um, I want to I, I yeah. want to touch in on this relativized word so I, I oh you called it now here's interesting maybe I can ask you this question you used the word I wrote it down relationalized versus yes. relativized yes. so I did, yeah I did that on purpose yeah so let's talk about that I wrote okay. it down because I think there's a couple things here which I haven't actually teased out fully so this will be novel for me oh, but good. Um, Okay, so here's the story. I, so my main teacher is Samuel Blonder and Waking Down crew, and Samuel's guru, with whom he lived with closely for 18 years, maybe 20 years, something like that, 18 years, I think, was um, Adida. And at some point in Adida's own practice life, a major inquiry for him, major, major inquiry, was avoiding relationship question mark. Am I avoiding relationship? And that somehow has seeded is has been a seed for my for my own my own insights into what this world is and is made out of. And relationship feels like the best word for it. Like it's not emptiness or it's not being, it's not one taste. I mean, all of those things are true, too, but if you get down to the paradox of self and other, like, at all scales, what feels like is going on at all moments is relationship. And that somehow seems to contain the impersonal and the personal at the same time. Everything is relationship. So that feels warm to me and it feels profound where the world where the word relativized has connotations of flattened or less you know less significant or something like that and that's not that's not what i mean right what i mean 
although, like I said, there's some shades of that which come with this feeling of nihilism, but, but it's actually more like intimacy, like engaging intimately. Everything is engaging intimately at all times with, it, with, each, with each other. And that intimacy feels like the heart of what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would um, say that my use of the term relativized should be interpreted more like you described relation, relationalized. Um, uh, relativism actually comes from, you know, fixing a frame of reference or a value. And the, the point is, those fixed frames are relative because everything is relationalized, right? So relationalized is the reason why we come up with this apparent illusion of relative values and relative this and relative that. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good distinction. Um, I uh, is think I'm thinking of, you know, of course, it, it's interesting because we think of these as cultural or interpersonal, intersubjective um, paradigm shifts, but science also um, often leads in in the interpretation of um, reality. It, it, when you know there is in a lot of quantum science now, they talk about there are no things. There's only events, and events are only e relations. You know, mm -hmm. there's just relational fields and and then people like Deleuze and Gattard and um, there they you know there's a lot of people who have moved toward this kind of new event relations cosmology um, languaging what it what things what things what are not things but just just as you said um, um, so instead of saying for example the panentheists were hard strung to say there's consciousness all the way up and all the way down that that gets a little tricky but if you say there's relationship all the way and up and down well then the relationship between a person a human and a human is not only different than the relationship an atom and an atom has, but it's still relationship. There's different ranges of relationship that humans and humans can have, right? So, so that word kind of serves serves better than than some of the other w ways of describing it. Mm -hmm. um, so, how does nihilism? Why would this view of a relationalized reality um, play with this this notion of nihilism. How do the, how do how how what's the relationship between that? You know. Yeah. I mean, so so we said when you use the term relative, we understand how that sits with nihilism or is more. Right prone to nihilism so let's let's move the concept of nihilism into this notion of relationalized right for myself i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um it could be that I, I liked what you said about um, putting in too much effort to make an insight practical. Like that feels like a very, very strong potential. Um, and um, or wanting to sh like holding on to certain ideas of showing up in the world in certain ways or wanting to be successful which I still want, but in, in ways that are maybe somehow creating like more feelings of darkness and tragedy or something like that. You know, it's 
It's unclear. Yeah, I'm, I'm like sitting. I'm just like total. I'm in the middle of it, and it's and it's not clear. Another thread for me is is again somehow this the relationalizing of everything, even life and death, makes it both feel like it's a possibility that I can't escape the world, even even if I were to die. Anyway, yet at the same time, life itself and engagements with life. Are all sort of, yeah. It's very personal. It's very personal. But, you know, and sometimes they're losing their excitement or their flavor. And I, but there is something to effort. You know, like at least for where I'm at now, the lesson that I'm learning is not has not been effortlessness. The lesson that I'm learning is that all things that are worthwhile take continued effort and work to bring to fruition. Mm-hmm. That's a burden. <laughs> You know, that's, I'm not actually all that good at, at practice. Yeah. Um, so there's, that's a, you know, there's, there's something there too. For me, the, the personal problem, I said this the other day, when I said it in a joke, but, you know, um, we were talking about, I was talking to somebody um, who's basically a business person and, um, wanted to Skype with me and wanted to um, learn from me. And um, as, as quite often happens, the business person has done a lot of things in their lives, been quite successful, um, has a brand, does consulting, blah, blah, blah. But they end up being bored, right? So um, we were talking around a little bit. He wanted to learn from me. And then he says, well, frankly, you know, I'm kind of bored. And um, so I was talking, telling this story to a friend of mine. And I was saying, well, I'm never bored. But, but. I'm probably irrelevant, right? So here's the there's the other there, there's the other side of it, you know. And so this person is a real name and has real money and goes all over the world and can feel relevant in in their world of boredom. And I'm never bored, but I actually feel pretty irrelevant to that to that world. And so we had a good laugh about that. And that's what I mean about not the effort in doing the work. I certainly put in a lot of effort to do all the things that I do that are irrelevant. But I can't really put any effort into making myself relevant because it's not it's not it's not within my control. You know, it it's just and it's the same thing whether it's practical. I think practical is a curious term practical relative to being relevant to what, you know? So we had a good laugh at that. And so I, I, I um, yeah, so my, my word for my worry is that, that I'm completely irrelevant, you know, <laughs> like I, I put all this work and I think I have all these good ideas and, you know, I think rather fondly of my productivity and then at the end of the day, it seems quite irrelevant. So, um, just a different take on it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, but I'm not bored. <laughs> right, I know. And, 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 and I would hope that in time you <laughs> feel more relevant, that you are seen as relevant. Um, the other thing that's interesting here is that I've heard that people who are successful. There's a story. There is a story, and I actually don't know how true it is. A myth. Um, Yes, a myth. There's a myth. There's a myth that people on their deathbed who have had very effective or very um, big lives or something look back and they think, what was that all for? (laughs) I wish I had spent more time with my family. (laughs) Something like that. (laughs) And at least you're living in your irrelevance consciously now, yeah, than just on your deathbed, you know. There's this great line in this 
kind of horse guru I have and he has a video and he says of course he's you know his charisma is just outstanding and he says I promise you it'll the little things that you will remember when it comes to the day you're going to die the leave he has an accent a Danish accent the leave the leave on the river the touch of your lover's hand that's what you'll remember I promise you he says so that's the same thing you know just just trusting it, it it gets it gets transmitted from so many different wise people that we have to trust it you know and and I do I I I um yeah <laughs> I used to be bored when I was a child, you know, it was awful. I, you know, I can remember being, I, I can remember that feeling of having energy and being bored, you know, with it. That, that's, that's a, it's an interesting state. And I guess that's one of those little things you'll remember because I can remember my mom being as mothers are, you know. You, when you're bored like that and you're a kid, you torture your mom, you know. And then she says, oh, do you want something to eat? And, it's, and then she goes to the cabinets. Do you want this? Do you want that? No. Do you want this? No. You know, and they're just trying to be in service. But basically, you're bored and you just want to, attack someone or <laughs> make trouble or something because if you if you get in a fight with your sister then at least you're not bored you know and this feeling of that energy is I wonder how many wars have been started because people are deeply bored <laughs> I, I'm telling you it's an interesting yeah talk about agency yeah so um, yeah Okay, maybe that's, uh, maybe we could stop there. We've been going for a while. Yeah, I think I, so. Yeah, I think we covered some grounds. And it has supreme irrelevancy. <laughs> supreme irrelevancy. <laughs> oh, man. Sounds like the title of a, well, not really. It sounds like the title of the modern American Tibetan Tantra. <laughs> No, it'd be like my gravestone. I I was supremely irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs>